Good afternoon, and welcome to Tesseraction Theater. We are really excited that you're here. Tesseraction is the world's only live animation theater, and we produce classic Broadway productions live online. When I say live, I mean actually performed right here, right now, by a troupe that's flung from coast to coast across the country. Some of us have webcams on to prove it. Wave hi, y'all. Before we start, let me introduce the troop. You can see some of us on cam and the others there in the top corner on our communications board. But we'll start all the way at the bottom with Woody. All right. Hello, hello. Where are you, Woody? I'm in Minnesota. Woohoo. Nice and chilly. <laughs> yeah, see how his blue light turns on when he talks? That's how we know he's there. At any rate, Woody is the voice of Colonel Pickering in this production. Next up the line is Sarah, and you can see she doesn't have a microphone. But say hi, Sarah. Hello from New Jersey. Yeah. We, she was getting a little help from that, yes. Now, Sarah doesn't have a microphone. She never really has. But she's been with the troupe forever, and we could not do without her. She's our most experienced avateer. Now, when I say avateer, you think puppeteer in an online stage. Avateers are essential to what we do. They create the action you see on the screen. see who's next up. Oh, that's Marcus. Hey, Marcus. Hello, hello from South Dakota. He's our design expert. He builds our sets, and today he's the cameraman for the production. Oh, LT. Yo, LT. Oh, and your very cute little very doggy. Cute little doggy. And this is Tyrion. Hello from California. Yes. Um, boy, I don't know what I would do. Where do I start with everything LT does? She's our costume mistress which means she is both an artist and a logistics expert, believe me. She's the voice for Mrs. Higgins, as well as both Mrs. Pierce and the parlor maid. Now, just to be sure that she and Tyrion don't get bored, she's also avateer for Alfie Doolittle and part-time for Eliza as well. Oh, Lord, stay healthy, girl. Next, let me say, oh, there's Larry Brown. Hi, Larry Brown. Hi, hello from California. Oh, another Californian. Uh, he is avateering one of our Cockney bystanders, but he's also the voice of Henry Higgins today. And Jack, who might be king of the world. How you doing, Jack? Howdy from Texas. Woohoo, Texas. We are everywhere. Uh, Jack is... Uh, the amazing voice behind Alfie Doolittle, and you're avateering something or other, aren't you, Jack? Uh, Clara. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me see. Up from Jack is Ginger. There's Gingers. Hi. I'm from North Carolina. And boy, are we glad. Ginger's the voice for Mrs. Einsford Hill and the avateer for Eliza. Uh, Drew, yo, Drew. Howdy, 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 from howdy, 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 from Oklahoma. And uh, let me see, what are you doing? Drew is the voice of a Cockney bystander, and he's also the, oh, the avatar for Freddie Einsford Hill. Uh, bandwidth Broad, how you doing? I am just Ichi Keen. Greetings from the Twilight Zone, otherwise known as Minnesota. <laughs> see, we thought you were in Alaska. Let me see. Uh, and I'm trying to remember what all you're doing. You are the voice of Clara. I know that. Oh, I know what. You're avateer. I'm walking Pickering. Yes, Colonel Pickering. <laughs> oh, there we go. And last but certainly not least is Melita. She is our technician. Say hi, Melita. Hi, Melita. <laughs> and where are you? I'm from Maryland. Alrighty, and... When I say technician, she has created an awful lot of the special effects that you see, uh, including, did you, I think you did the curtains too. I mean, everything. <laughs> uh, also, I might add, the voice of Eliza Doolittle. And I'm Rose, uh, you'll see me as the stage manager there at the bottom. 
and I'm everybody's understudy. I'm the stage manager, and I also, I'm in California. We've got a little clog up of Californians in this group. But, huh, troop, I think you better all get ready. Audience, stay right where you are, because in just a short time, Tesseraction Theater presents George Bernard Shaw's classic Pygmalion. Nobody was prepared and everybody had to take a cab. I've been to Charing Cross one way and nearly to Ludgate Circus the other. And they're all engaged. Did you find Trafalgar Square? There wasn't one at Trafalgar Square. Did you try, Freddy? I tried as far as Charing Cross. Did you expect me to walk a Hammersmith? You haven't tried at all. Oh, very well. I'll go. I'll go. Now then, Freddy, where are you going, dear? Father. Oh, there's manna for you. Two bunches of oil that dried in the mud. How do you know that my son's name is Freddy, Craig? Ow, he's your son, is he? Well, if you don't eat fine as a mother should, eat no better than a straw, four girls, flies, and ran away without pain. What are you calling me for? This is for your flowers. Thank you kindly, Lighty. Now, tell me how you know that young woman's name. I didn't. I heard you call him by it. Don't try to deceive me. Who's trying to deceive you? I'm not Freddy, but Charlie, Simon, you are if you stop it from trying your whiskey blood. <sighs> oh, sir, is there any sign of this stopping? I'm afraid not. It started worse than ever about two minutes ago. Wow. Oh, dear. If and it's worse, it's a sign it's nearly over. So see up, Scout, you and boy, I'm out of this world, girl. I'm sorry. I haven't been changed. What is giant cotton? For a sovereign? I've nothing less. Go on. How do you want it now, Mr. Captain? That's a giant jock of ground. Now, don't be troublesome. There's a good girl. I really haven't any change. Stop. Here's three half nuts, if that's any use to you. Oh, fine, sister. Oh, hey. Be careful. In my flower for it. There's a bloke here behind taking down every blessed word you're saying. I ain't 
done nothing wrong with speaking to a gentleman of a white right ass class and keep off the turf. I'm a respectable girl, so Elmo never spoke to him except he asked him for a hell for me. It's all right, it's all right. He's a gentleman. Look at his boots. I thought you was a copper's knock, sir. Just cut it off. What's a copper's knock? It's a, well, it's a copper's knock, uh, as you might say. Uh, what else would you call it? Uh, sort of an informer. Do I look like an policeman? Then what'd you take me words down for? How do I know if you took me down right? You just show me what you wrote about me. <gasps> What's that? That ain't rock writing. I can't read that. I can. Cheer up, keep an old flower of a poor girl. <gasps> oh, what's it called? I called him cotton. I didn't mean no um. Oh, sir, please don't lie a charge against me for a word like that. You don't know what it is. Charge? Means. I make no charge. Really, sir, if you are a detective, you need not begin protecting me against molestation by young women until I ask you. Anybody can see that the girl meant no harm. He ain't no tech. He's a blooming busybody. That's what he is. I tell you, look at his boots. And how are all your people down at Selzy? Oh, hey, who told you my people come from Selsey? Never you mind, they did. How do you come to be up so far east? You were born in Liston Grove. Oh, what arm was there me leaving Liston Grove? It won't fit for a pig to live in, and I had to buy four and six a week. <laughs> oh. Live where you like, but stop that noise. Come, come, he can't touch you. You have a right to live where you please. I'm a good girl, I am. You take us for dirt uh, under your feet, don't you? Catch us taking liberties with a gentleman. Yes, tell him where he come from if you want to go fortune telling. Cheltenham, Harrow, Cambridge, and India. Quite right. Oh. Oh, my oh. Yes, he told him, didn't he? Oh, he's no gentleman at the end to interfere with a bug girl. What on earth is Freddy doing? I shall get pneumonia if I stay in this draft any longer. Excuse me, you want a cab, do you? <gasps> Don't dare speak to me. Oh, please, please, Vera. We would be so grateful to you, sir, if you found us a cab. Oh, thank you. There, I knew he was a big clothes copper. That ain't no police whistle, that's a sporting whistle. You know right, I take away my character. My character's the same to me as any ladies. It's quite fine now, Clara. We can walk to a motor bus. Come. Yeah, but the cab. Poor oh, girl, I cannot I... live without being watered and chivied. How do you do it? If I may ask. Simply phonetics, the science of speech. That's my profession, also my hobby. Happy is the man who can make a living by his hobby. You can spot an Irishman or a Yorkshireman by his brogue. I can place any man within six miles. I can place him within two, two miles in London, sometimes within two streets. I have a right to be here if I like. So I leave his own business. But, but is there a living in that? Oh, yes, quite a fat one. This is an age of upstarts. Men begin in Kentish Town with 80 pounds a year and end in Park Lane with 100,000. They want to drop Kentish Town, but they give themselves away every time they open their mouths. Now, oh, I can teach them if they go... Oh, they are shy of Woman, cease this detestable boo-hooing instantly or else seek the shelter of some other place of worship. I'm a right to be here, Simon you. A woman who utters such depressing and disgusting sounds has no right to be anywhere, no right to live. Remember that you are a human being with a soul and the divine gift of articulate speech, that your native language, language is this language of Shakespeare and Milton and the Bible. And don't sit there crooning like a bellious pigeon. Oh! Ah! 
<laughs> what a sound! Ow! <laughs> Go on. You see this creature with her curbstone English, the English that will keep her in the gutter to the end of her days? Well, sir, in three months I could pass that girl off as a duchess at an ambassador's garden party. I could even get her a place as a lady's maid or shop assistant, which requires better English. That's the sort of thing I do for commercial millionaires, and on the profits of it I do genuine scientific work in phonetics, and a little as a poet on Miltonic lines. I am myself a student of Indian dialect, and... And are you, uh, do you know Colonel Pickering, the author of Sanskrit? I am Colonel Pickering. Who are you? Henry Higgins, author of Higgins' Universal Alphabet. I came from India to meet you. I was going to India to meet you. Where do you live? 27A Wimpole Street. Come and see me tomorrow. I am at the Carlton. Come with me now. Let's have a jowl for some supper. Right you are. Boy, boy and flower, kind gentleman. I'm both short for me lodging. I really haven't any change. I'm sorry. Liar, you said you could change half a crown. <gasps> oh, you ought to be stuffed with nails. You ought take the old blooming basket for sixpence. I uh, got one. I uh, got one at last. Uh, hello. Where are the two girls that were here? They walked to the bus when the rain stopped. And left me with a cab on my hands. Damnation. Never you mind, young man. I'm going home in that taxi. Well, I'm dashed. really amazing. I haven't taken half of it in, you know. Would you like to go over any of it again? No, thank you. Not now. I'm quite done up for this morning. A young woman wants to see you, sir. A young woman? What does she want? Well, sir, she says you'll be glad to see her when you know what she's come about. She's quite a common girl, sir. Very common indeed. I should have sent her away, only I thought perhaps you wanted her to talk into your machines. I hope I've not done wrong, but really you see such queer people sometimes. You'll excuse me, I'm sure, sir. Let's have her up. Show her up, Mrs. Pierce. Very well, sir. It's for you to say. This is rather a bit of luck. I'll show you how I make records. We'll set her talking, and I'll take it down first in Bell's visible speech, then in broad remic, and then we'll get her on the phonograph so that you can turn her on as often as you like with the written transcript before you. This is the young woman, sir. Well, this is the girl I jotted down last night. She's no use. I've got all the records I want of the list in Grovelingo, and I'm not going to waste another cylinder on it. Be off with you. I don't want you. Don't you be so saucy. You ain't heard what I come here for yet. Did you tell him I come in a taxi? Nonsense, girl. What do you think a gentleman like Mr. Higgins cares what you came in? Ah, oh, we are proud. He ain't about giving lessons, not him. I heard him say so. Well, I ain't come here to ask for any compliment, and if me money's not good enough, I can go elsewhere. Good enough for what? Good enough for you. 
Now you know, don't you? I come to have lessons on him and the pie for him, too. Make no mistake. Well, uh, what do you expect me to say to you? Well, if you was a gentleman, you might ask me to sit down, I think. Don't I tell you I'm bringing your business? Pickering, shall we ask this badger to sit down, or shall we throw her out of the window? Oh! I won't be called a baggage when I offer the pie like any lady. What is it you want, my girl? Hmm. Oh, I want to be a lady in a flash shop, instead of selling at the corner of Tottenham Court Road. But they won't like me unless I talk more genteel. Easily could teach me. Well, here I am, ready to buy him, not asking any fiver. And he treats me like I was dead. How can you be such a foolish, ignorant gal as to think you could afford to pay, Mr. Higgins? Why shouldn't I? I know what lessons cost well as you do, and I'm ready to buy. How much? Now you're talking. I thought you'd come off it when you saw a chance of getting a bit back of what you chucked at me last night. You'd had a bit in, hadn't you? Sit down. Al, if you're going to make a compliment on Sit, sit down, down, girl. Do as you're told. Ow. Won't you sit down? Ow. <laughs> uh, don't mind if I do. What's your name? Liza Doolittle. How much do you propose to pay me for the lessons? Oh, oh I, know I know what's what right. You. A lady friend of mine gets French, French lessons, lessons for 18 pence an hour from a real French gentleman. Well, you wouldn't have the face to ask me the same for teaching me my own language as you would for French. So I won't give you more than a shilling. Take it or leave it. You know, Pickering, if you consider a shilling not as a simple shilling but as a percentage of this girl's income, it works out as fully equivalent to 60 or 70 guineas from a millionaire. How so? Figure it out. A millionaire has about one hundred fifty pounds a day. She earns about half a crown. Oh, told you I only. Earn she offers half me two crown. fifths of her day's income for a lesson. Two fifths of a millionaire's income for a day would be somewhere about uh, sixty pounds. It's handsome. By George, it's enormous. It's the biggest offer I ever had. Sixty pounds. What are you talking about? I never offered you sixty pounds. Where would I get sixty pounds? Don't cry, you silly girl. Nobody's going to touch your money. Somebody's going to touch with a boomstick if he don't stop sniveling. Oh, one would think you was me father. If I decide to teach you, I'll be worse than two fathers to you. Here. Higgins. Yeah. I'm interested. What about the ambassador's garden party? I'll say you're the greatest teacher alive if you make that good. I'll bet you all the expenses of the experiment. You can't do it. And I'll pay for the lessons. Oh, you're real good, Cam. Thank you. It's almost irresistible. It's so deliciously low, so horribly dirty. I, oh, I just, I, just... I ain't dirty. I wash me face and hands before I come, I did. I do hope, sir, you won't encourage him to do anything foolish. What is life but a series of inspired follies? The difficulty is to find them to do. Never lose a chance. It doesn't come every day. I shall make a duchess of this draggle-tailed gutter snipe. Oh! Yes, in six months, in three, if she has a good ear and a quick tongue, I'll take her anywhere and pass her off as anything. We'll start today. Now, this moment. Take her away and clean her, Mrs. Pierce. Monkey brand, if it won't come off any other way. Is there a good fire in the kitchen? Yes, but really, Mr. Higgins... Now take all her clothes off and burn them. Ring up Whiteley or somebody for new ones. Wrap her up in brown paper till they come. You're no gentleman, you're not. The talk is such things. I'm a good, good girl I am, and I know what the like of you are, I do. But I've no place to put her. Put her in the dust in. Ow! Oh, come, Higgins. Reasonable. You must be reasonable, Mr. Higgins. Really, you must. You can't walk over everybody like this. I walk over everybody, my dear Mrs. Pierce. My dear Pickering, I never had the slightest intention of walking over anyone. All I propose is that we should be kind to this poor girl. We must help her to prepare and fit herself for her new station in life. If I did not express myself clearly, it was because I did not wish to hurt her delicacy or yours. Well, did you ever hear anything like that, sir? <laughs> never, Mrs. Pierce, never. What's the matter? Well, the matter is, sir, that you can't take a girl up like that as if you were picking up a pebble on the beach. 
Why not? Why not? What, you don't know anything about her. What about her parents? She may be married. Go on. There, as the girl very properly says, God, married indeed. Don't you know that a woman of that class looks a worn-out drudge of fifty a year after she's married? I'm going to wipe. Oh, Ease off his jump ears. I don't want no bomies teaching me. Oh, indeed. I'm mad, am I? Very well, Mrs. Pierce. You needn't order the new clothes for her. Throw her out. <laughs> I didn't want new clothes. I wouldn't have taken them. I can buy me own clothes. The courtier Higgins that the girl has some feelings? Oh, uh, no, I, I don't think so. Well, not any feelings that we need bother about. Have you, Eliza? I got me feeling same as anyone else. You see the difficulty? Eh? What difficulty? To get her to talk grammar. The mere pronunciation is easy enough. I don't want to talk no grammar. I want to talk like a lady. Will you please keep to the point, Mr. Higgins? I want to know in what terms the girl is to be here. Is she to have any wages? And what is to become of her when you finished your teaching? You must look ahead a little. What's to become of her if I leave her in the gutter? Tell me that, Mrs. Pierce. That's her own business, not yours, Mr. Higgins. Well, when I'm done with her, we can throw her back into the gutter, and then it will be her own business again, so that's all right. Oh, you know, feeling art in you. You don't care for nothing but yourself. Yeah, I've had enough of this. I'm gone. You, you are a bit ashamed of yourself, you are. Have some chocolates, Eliza. <gasps> oh, how do I know what might be in them? I've heard a girl's being drugged by the like of you. Mr. Higgins, you're tempting the girl. It's not right. She should think of the future. At her age? Nonsense. Time enough to think of the future when you haven't any future to think of. No, Eliza, do as this lady does. Think of other people's futures, but never think of your own. Think of chocolates and taxis and gold and diamonds. No, I don't want no gold, no diamond. I'm a good girl, I am. You shall remain so, Eliza, under the care of Mrs. Pierce, and you shall marry an officer in the guards with a beautiful moustache, the son of a marquis, who will disinherit him for marrying you, but will relent when he sees your beauty and goodness Excuse and all your Excuse me, wonderful... Higgins, but I really must interfere. Mrs. Pierce is quite right. If this girl is to put herself in your hands for six months for an experiment in teaching, she must understand thoroughly what she's doing. How can she? She's incapable of understanding anything. Besides, do any of us understand what we are doing? If we did, would we ever do it? Very clever, Higgins, but not sound sense. Uh, Miss Doolittle? Oh. There, that's all you'll get out of Eliza. Oh, no use explaining. As a military man, you ought to know that. Give her her orders, that's what she wants. Eliza. You are to live here for the next six months, learning how to speak beautifully, like a lady in a florist shop. If you're good and do whatever you're told, you shall sleep in a proper bedroom and have lots to eat and money to buy chocolates and take rides in taxis. If you're naughty and idle, you will sleep in the back kitchen among the black beetles and be walloped by Mrs. Pierce with a broomstick. At the end of six months, you shall go to Buckingham Palace in a carriage, Beautifully dressed. If the king finds out you're not a lady, you will be taken by the police to the Tower of London, where your head will be cut off as a warning to other presumptuous flower girls. If you are not found out, you shall have a present of seven and sixpence to start life with as a lady in a shop. If you refuse this offer, you will be a most ungrateful and wicked girl, and the angels will weep for you. Now, are you satisfied, Pickering? Can I put it more plainly and fairly, Mrs. Pierce? I think you'd better let me speak to the girl properly in private. I don't know that I can take charge of her or consent to the arrangement at all. Of course, I know you don't mean her any harm, but when you get what you call interested in people's accents, you never think or care what may happen to them or you. Come with me, Eliza. Uh, that's all right. Thank you, Mrs. Pierce. Go off to the bathroom. You're a great bully, you are. I won't stay here if I don't like, and they won't let nobody look well at me. I never asked to go to Buckingham Palace, I didn't. I was never in trouble with the police, not me. I'm a good guy. Oh, don't answer back, girl. You don't understand the gentleman. Come with me. Well, what I say is right. I won't go near the king, not if I'm to have me head cut off. 
If I'd have known what I was letting myself in for, I wouldn't have come here. I always been a good girl, and I never offered to say a word to him, and I don't owe him nothing, and I don't care. I won't be put upon, and I have me feelings the same as anyone else. Excuse the straight question, Higgins. Uh, are you a man of good character where women are concerned? Have you ever met a man of good character where women are concerned? Yes, very frequently. Well, I haven't. I find that the moment I let a woman make friends with me, she becomes jealous, exacting, suspicious, and a damned nuisance. I find that the moment I let myself make friends with a woman, I become selfish and tyrannical. Women upset everything. When you let them into your life, you find that the woman is driving at one thing and you're driving at another. Come, Higgins. You know what I mean. If I'm to be in this business, I shall feel responsible for that girl. I hope it's understood that no advantage is to be taken of her position. What? That thing? Sacred, I assure you. You see, she'll be a pupil, and teaching would be impossible unless pupils were sacred. I've taught scores of American millionaires how to speak English, the best-looking women in the world. I'm seasoned. They might as well be blocks of wood. I might as well be a block of wood. It's... Well, what have you to say to me, Mrs. Pierce? Am, am I in the way? Not at all, sir. Mr. Higgins, you please be very particular what you say before the girl. Of course, I'm always particular about what I say. Why do you say this to me? No, sir, you're not at all particular when you've mislaid anything or when you get a little impatient. Now, it doesn't matter before me. I'm used to it. But you really must not swear before the girl. I swear? I never swear. I detest the habit. What the devil do you mean? That's what I mean, sir. You swear a great deal too much. I don't mind your damning and blasting and what the devil and where the devil and who the devil. This is just this language from your lips. But there is a certain word I must ask you not use. The girl has just used it herself because the bath was too hot. It begins with the same letter as bath. She knows no better. She learned it at her mother's knee, but she must not hear it from your lips. I cannot charge myself with having ever uttered it, Mrs. Pierce. Um, except perhaps in a moment of extreme and justifiable excitement. Only this morning, sir, you applied it to your boots, to the butter, and to the brown bread. Oh, that! Mere alliteration, Mrs. Pierce. Natural to a poet. Well, sir, whatever you choose to call it, I beg you not to let the girl hear you repeat it. Oh, very well, very well. Is that all? No, sir. We shall have to be very particular with this girl as to personal cleanliness. Oh, very well, very well. And by that, I mean we may not come down to breakfast in our dressing gown, we may not leave our slippers under the piano, and we may not use our cravat as a napkin. I hope you're not offended, Mr. Higgins. Uh, not at all, not at all. Uh, you're quite right, Mrs. Pierce. I shall be particularly careful before the girl. Is that all? No, sir. Might she use some of those Japanese dresses you brought from abroad? I really can't put her back into her old thing. Certainly. Anything you like. Is that all? Thank you, sir. That's all. You, you know, Pickering, that woman has the most extraordinary ideas about me. Here I am, a shy, diffident sort of man. I've never been able to feel really grown up and tremendous like other chaps, and yet she's firmly persuaded that I'm an arbitrary, overbearing, bossing kind of person. I can't account for it. If you please, sir, the trouble's beginning already. There's a dustman downstairs. Alfred Doolittle wants to see you. He says you have his daughter here. True, I say. Send the blackguard up! Very well, sir. He may not be a blackguard, Higgins. Whether he is or not, I'm afraid we shall have some trouble with him. God. Nonsense, of course he's a blackguard. Uh, uh, I, I don't think I'll have any trouble with him. He shall have it with me, and we are sure to get something interesting out of him. About the girl? No, I mean his dialect. Oh. Do little, sir. Professor Higgins? Yeah. Good morning. Morning, Governor. Or come about very serious matter, Governor. Brought up in Hounslow. Or the Welsh, I should think. What do you want, Doolittle? I want my daughter. That's what I want, say. Of course you do. You're her father, aren't you? You don't suppose anyone else wants her, do you? I'm glad to see you have some spark of family feeling left. She's upstairs. 
Take her away at once. Why? Your daughter had the audacity to come to my house and ask me to teach her how to speak properly so that she could get a place in a flower shop. This gentleman and my housekeeper have been here all the time. How dare you come here and attempt to blackmail me? You sent her here on purpose. No, 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 Governor. You must have. How else could you possibly know that she is here? Don't take a man up like that, Governor. The police shall take you up. Uh, have I asked you for a brass farthing? Leave it to the gentleman here. Have I said a word about money? Uh, oh, Alfred, did you put her up to it? So help me, Governor, I never did. I take my Bible oath. I ain't seen the girl these two months past. Then how did you know she was here? I'll tell you, Governor, if you'll only let me get a word in. I'm willing to tell you. I'm wanting to tell you. I'm waiting to tell you. Pickering, this chap has a certain natural gift of rhetoric. Observe the rhythm of his native wood notes wild. I'm willing to tell you. I'm wanting to tell you. I'm waiting to tell you. Sentimental rhetoric. Well, that's the Welsh strain in him. Oh, please, Higgins. I'm West Country myself. How did you know the girl was here if you didn't send her? It was like this, Governor. The girl took a boy in the taxi to give him a jaunt. The son of a landlady he is. He hung about on the chance of her giving him another ride home. Well, she sent him back for her luggage when she heard he was willing for her to stop here. I met the boy at the corner of Long Acre and Endale Street. Public house, yes? The poor man's club, Governor. Why shouldn't I? I he told me what was up, and I ask you what was my feelings and my duty as a father. I says to the boy, you bring me the luggage, I says, and... Why didn't you go for it yourself? Landlady wouldn't have trusted me with it, Governor. She's that kind of woman, you know. I had to give the boy a penny for he trusted me with it, the little swine. I brought it to her just to oblige you like, and, and to make myself agreeable. That's all. How much luggage? Musical instrument, Governor, a few pictures, a trifle of jewelry, and a birdcage. She said she didn't want no clothes. What was I to think of that, Governor? I ask you as a parent, what was I to think? But why did you bring her luggage if you intended to dip her away? Have I said a word about taking her away? Have I now? You're going to take her away double quick! The... Mrs. Pierce, this is Eliza's father. He has come to take her away. Give her to him. No, this is a misunderstanding. Listen here. You oh, can't oh, take her away, Mr. Higgins. How can he? You told me to burn her clothes. That's right. I can't carry the girl through the streets like a blooming monkey, can I? I put it to you. You have put it to me that you want your daughter. Take your daughter. There's no clothes. Go out and buy her some. Where's the she come in? Did I burn them or did your missus here? I am the housekeeper, if you please. I have sent for some clothes for your girl. When they come, you can take her away. You can wait in the kitchen. This way, please. But, li listen here, Governor. You and me as men of the world, ain't we? Oh, men of the world, are we? Uh, you'd better go, Mrs. Pierce. I think so indeed, sir. The floor is yours, Mr. Doolittle. <clears throat> I thank you, Governor. Well, the tr truth is, I've taken sort of a fancy to you, Governor. If you want the girl, I'm not so set on having her back home again, but what I might be open to an arrangement. All I ask is my right as a father, and you're the last man alive to expect me to let her go for nothing. For well, I can see you're one of the straight sort, Governor. Well, what's a five-pound note to you, and what's lies that to me? I think you ought to know, Doolittle, that Mr. Higgins' intentions are entirely honourable. Course they are, Governor. If I thought they wasn't, I'd ask fifty. Do you mean to say, you callous rascal, that you would sell your daughter for fifty pounds? Not in a general way I wouldn't, but to oblige a gentleman like you, I'd do a good deal, I do assure you. Have you no morals, man? Can't afford them, Governor. Neither could you if you was as was me. Not that I mean any harm, you know. But if Liza's going to have a bit of this, why not me too? I don't know what to do, Pickering. 
there can be no question that, as a matter of morals, it's a positive crime to give this chap a farthing, and yet I feel a sort of rough justice in his claim. Well, I know the feeling, but it really seems hardly right. Don't say that, Governor. Don't look at that way. What am I, Governor's both? I ask you, what am I? I'm one of the undeserving poor, that's what I am. Think of what that means to a man. It means he's up against middle-class morality all the time. If there's anything going and I put in for a bit of it, it's always the same story. You're undeserving, so you can't have it. But my needs is as great as the most deserving widows that ever got money out of six different charities in one week for the death of the same husband. I don't need less than a deserving man, or need more. I don't eat less hearty than him, and, and I drink a lot more. I want bit amusement, because I'm a thinking man. I want cheerfulness and a song and a band when I feel low. Well, they charge me just the same for everything as they charge the deserving. What is middle-class morality? Just an excuse to never giving me anything. Therefore, I ask you as two gentlemen, not to play that game on me. I'm playing straight with you. I ain't pretending to be deserving. I'm undeserving, and I mean to go on being undeserving. I like it, and that's the truth. Will you take advantage of a man's nature to do him out of the price of his own doll while he's brought up and fed and clothed by the sweat of his own brow until she's grown big enough to be interesting to you two gentlemen? Is five pounds unreasonable? I put it to you, and I leave it to you. Pickering, Pickering, if we were to take this man in hand for three months, he could choose between a seat in the cabinet and a popular pulpit in Wales. What do you say to that, Doolittle? No, not me, Governor. Thank you kindly. I've heard all the preachers and all the prime ministers, but I'm a thinking man, and a game for politics or religion or social reform, same as all the other amusements. And I tell you... It's a dog's life, no matter how you look at it. Undeserving poverty is my line. Taking one station in society with another, it's, it's, well, it's the only one that has any ginger in it, to my taste. I suppose we must give him a fiver. He'll make a bad use of it, I'm afraid. Not me, Governor, so help me I won't. Don't you be afraid that I'll save it and, then, and spare it and, and live idle on it? There won't be a penny of it left by Monday. I'll have to go to the work as same as I've, I'd never had it. It won't pauperize me, you bet. Just one good spree for myself and my missus. Giving pleasure to ourselves and employment to others. The satisfaction to you to, to think it has not been thrown away. You couldn't spend it better. This is irresistible. Let's give him ten. No, Governor. She wouldn't have the art to spend ten, and perhaps I shouldn't either. Ten pounds is a lot of money. Makes a man feel prudent like, and then good boy to happiness. You give me what I ask you, Governor. Not a penny more, not a penny less. Pickering, if we listen to this man another minute, we shall have no convictions left. Five pounds, I think you said? Thank you kindly, Governor. You're sure you won't take ten? Not now. Another time, Governor. Here you are. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. Beg pardon, miss. Go on. Don't you know your own daughter? Blimey, it's Liza. What, miss? By Jove. <laughs> don't oh, I look Liza. silly? Silly? Now, Mr. Higgins, please don't say anything to make the girl conceited about herself. Oh, quite right, Mrs. Pierce. Yes, damn silly. Please, sir. I, I mean, extremely silly. Well, I never thought she'd clean up as good looking as that, Governor. She's a credit to me, ain't she? I tell you, it's easy to clean up here. Hot and cold water on top, just as much as you like, there is. Woolly towels, there is. With a towel or so hot, it burns your fingers. Oh, soft brushes, like it, to scrub yourself with. And a wooden bowl of soup smelling like primroses. Now I know why Lydis is so clean. Washing's a treat for him. Wish they saw what it was for the like of me. I'm glad the bathroom met with your approval. I'm a good girl, I am. I won't pick up no frying icy wise.
Eliza, if you say again that you're a good girl, your father shall take you home. <laughs> Not him. You don't know me father. All he come here for was to touch you for some money to get drunk on. Well, what else would I want my for? To put in the plate in church, I suppose. Don't you give me none of your lip. And don't let me hear you give this gentleman any of it, neither. Or you'll hear from me, see? Have you any further advice to give her before you go, Doolittle? Your blessing, for instance? No, Governor. I ain't such a mug as to put up my children to all I know myself. Odd enough to hold a man without that. If you want Liza's mind improved, Governor, you do it yourself with a strap. So long, gentlemen. Stop! You'll come regularly to see your daughter. It's your duty, you know. My brother is a clergyman, and he could help you in your talks with her. It certainly I'll come, Governor. Not just this way, because I've got a job at a distance, but later on you may depend on me. Afternoon, gentlemen. Afternoon, Mum. Oh, don't, don't you believe the old liar. It is soon you set a bulldog on him as a clergyman. You won't see him again in a hurry. I don't want to, Eliza. You? Not, Not me. me. I don't want to never see him again, I don't. He's a disgrace to me, he is. Collecting dust instead of working at his trade. What is his trade, Eliza? Talking money, money out of other people's pockets into his own. His proper trade's a navy, and he works at it sometimes, too, for exercise. And he earns good money out of it. Hmm. Aren't you going to call me Miss Doolittle anymore? I beg your pardon, Miss Doolittle. It was a slip of the tongue. Oh, Ow, I don't, I don't mind. Only it sounded so genteel. I should just like to take a taxi to the torn corner of Tottenham Court Road and get out there and tell it to wait for me, just to put the girls in a place a bit. I wouldn't speak to them, you know. Better wait, wait till we get you something really fashionable. Besides, you shouldn't cut your old friends now that you have risen in the world. That's what we call snobbery. You don't call the like of them me friends now, I should hope. They took it out on me often enough with their ridicule when I had a chance. Now I mean to get a bit me own back. But if I'm to have fashionable clothes, I'll wait. I should like to have some. Miss Pierce says you're going to give me some to wear in bed at night. Different from what I wear during the daytime. But it do seem a waste of money when you could get something to show. Besides, I never could fancy changing it into cold things on a winter night. Now, Eliza, the new things have come for you to try on. Oh! Oh, don't rush about like that, girl. Pickering, we have taken on a stiff job. Higgins, we have. doing here today it's my at home day you promised not to come oh bother. go home at once I, I know mother i came on purpose but 
you mustn't. I'm serious, Henry. You offend all my friends. They stop coming whenever they meet you. Nonsense. I know I have no small talk. People don't mind. Oh, don't they? Small talk, indeed. What about your large talk? Really, dear, you mustn't stay. I must. I have a job for you, a phonetic job. No use, dear. I'm sorry, but I can't get round your vowels. Though I like to get pretty postcards in your patent shorthand, I always have to read the copies in ordinary writing you so thoughtfully send me. Well, this isn't a phonetic job. You said it was. Well, not your part of it. I've picked up a girl. Does that mean some girl has picked you up? Uh, no, no, not at all. I, I don't mean a love affair. What a pity. She's coming to see you. Indeed? Why? Well, it's like this. She's a common flower girl. I picked her off the curbstone. And invited her to my at home. Well, that'll be all right. I've taught her to speak properly, and she has strict orders as to her behavior. She's to keep to two subjects, the weather and everybody's health. Fine day, and how do you do, you know? And not to let herself go on things in general. That'll be safe. Safe? To talk about our health? About our insides? Perhaps about our outsides? How could you be so silly, Henry? Oh, she must talk about something! Oh, she'll be all right, don't you fuss. Pickering is in it with me. I have a sort of bet on that I pass her off as a duchess in six months. I started on her some months ago, and she's getting on like a house on fire. I shall win my bet. She talks English almost as you talk French. That's satisfactory, at all events. Well, it is and it isn't. What does that mean? Well, you see, I've got her pronunciation all right, but you have to consider not only how a girl pronounces, but what she pronounces, and that's where that's we where still we have the... Messes and mess, I inform the hill. Oh, Lord. How are you today, you? Mrs. Ainsford Hill? Miss Ainsford Hill, my son, Henry. <gasps> How do you do? My son, Henry. You cel celebrated son. I had so longed to meet you, Professor Higgins. Delighted. How do you do? I've seen you somewhere before. I haven't the ghost of a notion where, but I've heard your voice. Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, you'd better sit down. I'm sorry to say my celebrated son has no manners. You mustn't mind him. Colonel Pickering! How do you do, Mrs. Higgins? So glad you've come. You know Mrs. Ainsford Hill? Miss Ainsford Hill? Has Henry told you what we've before? We were interrupted, damn it. Oh, Henry. Henry, really? Are we in the way? No, no. You couldn't have come more... Fortunately, we want you to meet a friend of ours. Yes, by George, we want two or three people. You'll do as well as anybody else. Master Einsford Hill. Out of heaven, another of them. Ah, they do. Very good of you to come, Colonel Pickering. Ah, they do. I don't think you know my son, Professor Higgins. Ah, they do. Well, here we are, anyhow. Uh, and now, uh, what the devil are we going to talk about until Eliza comes? Miss Doolittle! She is, Mother. How do you do, Mrs. Higgins? Mr. Higgins told me I might come. Right, I'm very glad indeed to see you. How do you do, Miss Doolittle? Colonel Pickering, is it not? I feel sure we have met before, Miss Doolittle. I remember your eyes. How do you do? My daughter Clara. How do you do? How do you do? I've certainly had the pleasure. My son, Freddy? How do you do? Will it rain, do you think? The shallow depression in the west of these islands is likely to move slowly in an easterly direction. There are no indications of any great change in the barometrical situation. <laughs> awfully, <laughs> awfully funny. What is wrong with that young man? 
I bet I got it right. Killing. I'm sure I hope won't turn cold. There's so much influenza about. It runs right through our family regularly every spring. My aunt died of influenza, so they said. But it's my belief they done the old woman in. Done her in? Yes, Lord love you. Why should she die of influenza? She come through diphtheria right enough the year before. I saw her with my own eyes. Fairly blue with it she was. They all thought she was dead. But my father, he kept ladling gin down her throat. Till she came to so sudden that she bit the bowl off the spoon. Dear me! What call would a woman with that strength in her have to die of influenza? What become of her new straw hat that should have come to me? Somebody pinched it, and what I say is them as pinched it done her in. What does doing her in mean? Oh, that's the new small talk. To do a person in means to kill them. You surely don't believe that your aunt was killed. Do I not? Them she lived with would have killed her for a hat pin, let alone a hat. But it can't have been right for your father to pour spirits down her throat like that. It might have killed her. Not her. Gin was mother's milk to her. Besides, he'd poured so much down his own throat that he knew the good of it. Do you mean that he drank? Drank? My word. Something chronic. Oh, how dreadful for you. Not a bit. It never did him no harm, what I could see. But then he did not keep it up regular. On the burst, you might say, from time to time and always more agreeable when he'd had a drop in. When he was out of work, my mother used to give him four pence and tell him to go out and not come back until he'd drunk himself cheerful and loving-like. There's lots of women has to make their husbands drunk to make them fit to live with. You see, it's like this. If a man has a bit of a conscience, it always takes him when he's sober, and then it makes him low-spirited. A drop of booze just takes that off, and makes him happy. Here, here, what are you sniggering at? The new small talk, you do it so awfully well. If I was doing it proper, what was you laughing at? Have I said anything I oughtn't? Not at all, Miss Doolittle. Well, that's a mercy, anyhow. What I always say uh, uh, is... Uh, um, um. Oh, <laughs> well, I must go. So pleased to have met you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Colonel Pickering. Goodbye, Mr. Little. Goodbye, all. Are you walking across the park, Mr. Little? If so, I would... Walk? Make... Not bloody likely. I'm going in a taxi. Well, <laughs> after that, I think it's time for us to go. <laughs> oh, yes. We have three at-homes to go to still. <laughs> Goodbye, Mrs. Higgins. Goodbye, Colonel Pickering. Goodbye, Professor Higgins. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Ainsford Hill. Would you like to meet Mr. Little again? Oh, yes, most definitely. Well, you know my days. Yes, yes, thanks awfully. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Higgins. Oh, goodbye, goodbye. 
Goodbye. You mustn't mind, Clara. We're so poor, and she gets so few parties. Poor child. She doesn't quite know. But the boy is nice, don't you think so? Oh, quite nice. I shall always be delighted to see him. Thank you, dear. Bye. Well, is Eliza presentable? You silly boy, of course she's not presentable. She's a triumph of your art and of her dressmakers. But do you suppose for a moment she doesn't give herself away in every sentence she utters? You must be perfectly cracked about it. But don't you think something might be done? I mean, something to eliminate the sanguinary element from her conversation? Not as long as she's in Henry's hands. Well, I, I must say... Come, Higgins. You must learn to know yourself. I haven't heard such language as yours since we used to review the volunteers in Hyde Park twenty years ago. Oh, well, if you say so. I suppose I don't always talk like a bishop. Like a bishop. Colonel Pickering, will you tell me what is the exact state of things in Wimpole Street? Well, I have come to live there with Henry. We work together at my Indian dialects. And we think it more convenient. Quite so. I know all about that. It's an excellent arrangement. But where does this girl live? With us, of course. Where would she live? But on what terms? Is she a servant? If not, what is she? I think I know what you mean, Mrs. Higgins. Well, dash me if I do. I have to work at the girl every day for months to get her to a present pitch. Right. She's useful. She knows where my things are and remembers my appointments and so forth. How does your housekeeper get on with her? Oh, uh, Mrs. Pierce, she... Oh, she's jolly glad to get so much taken off her hands. For well, before Eliza came, she had to have to find things and remind me of my appointments. But she's got some silly bee in her bonnet about Eliza. She keeps saying, No, don't think, sir, doesn't she, Pick? Yes, that's the formula. You don't think, sir. That's the end of every conversation about Eliza. As if I ever stop thinking about the girl and her confounded vowels and consonants. I'm worn out thinking about her and watching her lips and her teeth and her tongue. Not to mention her soul, which is the quaintest, the quaintest of the lot. You certainly are a pretty pair of babies playing with your live doll. Playing? The hardest job I ever tackled. Make no mistake about that, Mother. But you have no idea how frightfully interesting it is to take a human being and change it into quite different human being by creating a new speech for her. It's filling up the deepest gulf that separates class from class and soul from soul. Yes, it's enormously interesting. I assure you, Mrs. Higgins, we take Eliza very seriously. Every week, every day almost, there is some new change. We keep records of every stage, dozens of gramophone discs and photographs. Yes, my George, it's the most absorbing experiment I ever tackled. She regularly fills our lives up, doesn't she, Pick? We're always talking Eliza. Teaching Eliza. Dressing Eliza. Inventing what? new Elizas. You know, she no, has I the most you, extraordinary Pierce, quickness of ear, the, the just like a parrot. She can play I tried it with every possible sort of sound that a human being can make. Music calls and dialects, African dialects, African dialects, African dialects plays, everything. Top she clicks. Right off, it took me home. years to get those. <laughs> and those she picks them up like a shot right away. And so she actually had it all her life. I beg your pardon. Sorry, when Pickering starts shouting, nobody can get a word in edgeways. Be quiet, Henry. Colonel Pickering, don't you realize that when Eliza walked into Wimpole Street, something walked in with her? But what? A problem. Oh, I see. The problem of how to pass her off as a lady. No, you two infinitely stupid male creatures. The problem of what is to be done with her afterwards. I don't see anything in that. She can go her own way with all the advantages I've given her. The advantages of that poor woman who was here just now? The manners and habits that disqualify a fine lady from earning her own living without giving her a fine lady's income? Is that what you mean? Oh, that would be all right, Mrs. Higgins. We'll find us some light employment. There are plenty of openings. We'll do what's right. Goodbye. Oh, men! Men! Men!
safe here. Lock up, will you? I, I shan't be going out again. Right. Can Mrs. Pierce go to bed? We don't want anything more, do we? Lord, no. Oh, oh, Lord, what an evening. What a crew. What a silly tomfoolery. Well, I feel a bit tired. It's been a long day. The garden party, the dinner party, and the opera. Rather too much of a good thing. But you've won your bet, Higgins. Eliza did the trick. And something to spare, eh? Thank God it's over. Were you nervous at all at the garden party? I was. Eliza didn't seem a bit nervous. Oh, she wasn't nervous. I knew she'd be all right. Now, it's the strain of putting the job through all these months that is told on me. It was interesting enough at first while we were at the phonetics, but after that I got deadly sick of it. If I hadn't backed myself to do it, I should have chucked the whole thing up two months ago. It was a silly notion. The whole thing has been a bore. Oh, come. The garden party was frightfully exciting. My heart began beating like anything. Yes, for the first three minutes, but when I saw we were going to win hands down, I felt like a bear in a cage, hanging about doing nothing. The whole thing has been simple purgatory. You've never been broken in up improperly to the social routine. Anyhow, it was a great success, an immense success. I was quite frightened once or twice because Eliza was doing so well. There's always something professional about doing a thing superlatively well. However, it's over and done with, and now I can go to bed at last without dreading tomorrow. I think I shall turn in, too. Still, it's been a great occasion, a triumph for you. Good night. Good night. Put out the lights, Eliza, and tell Mrs. Pierce not to make coffee for me in the morning. I'll take tea. What the devil have I done with my slippers? There are your slippers. And there, take your slippers. And may you never have a day's luck with them. What on earth? Anything wrong? Nothing's wrong with you. I've won your bet for you, haven't I? That's enough for you. I don't matter, I suppose. You won my bet. You, dumptuous insect, I won it. What did you throw those slippers at me for? Because I wanted to smash your face. I'd like to kill you, you selfish brute. Why didn't you leave me where you picked me out of? In the gutter. You thank God it's all over, and that now you can throw me back there again, do you? The creature is nervous after all. Ah! How dare you show your temper to me? Sit down and be quiet. What's to become of me? What's to become of me? How the devil do I know what's to become of you? What does it matter what becomes of you? You don't care. I know you don't care. You wouldn't care if I was dead. I'm nothing to you. Not so much as those slippers. Those slippers? Those slippers. I didn't think it made any difference now. Uh, this has been coming on you for some days. I suppose it was natural for you to be anxious about the garden party. It's all over now. There's nothing more to worry about. No. Nothing more for you to worry about. Oh, God, I wish I was dead. Why? In heaven's name, why? Listen to me, Eliza. All this irritation is purely subjective. I don't understand. I'm too ignorant. It's only imagination. No spirits and nothing else. Nobody's hurting you. Nothing's wrong. You'll go to bed like a good girl and sleep it off. Have a little cry and say your prayers. That will make you comfortable. I heard your prayers. Thank God it's all over. Well, don't you thank God it's all over? Now you are free and you can do what you want. What am I fit for? What have you left me fit for? <laughs> Where am I to go? What am I to do? What's to become of me? Oh, that's what's worrying you, is it? 
I shouldn't bother about it if I were you. I should imagine you won't have much difficulty in settling yourself uh, somewhere or other, though I hadn't quite realized that you were going away. You might marry, you know. You see, Eliza, all men are not confirmed old bachelors like me and the Colonel. Most men are the marrying sort, poor devils. And you're not bad-looking. It's quite a pleasure to look at you sometimes. Not now, of course, because you're crying and looking as ugly as the very devil. But when you're all right and quite yourself, you're what I should call attractive. That is, uh, to the people in the marrying line, you understand. Um, you go to bed and have a good, nice rest, and then get up and look at yourself in the glass, and, and you won't feel so cheap. I dare say my mother could find some chap or other who would do very well if you were we inclined were to... We were above that at the corner of Tottenham Court Road. What do you mean? I sold flowers. I didn't sell myself. Now you've made a lady of me, and I'm not fit to sell anything else. Oh, I wish you'd left me where you found me. Tosh, Eliza, don't you insult human relations by dragging all this conduct about buying and selling into it. You needn't marry the fellow if you don't like him. What else have I to do? Oh, lots of things. About your old idea of a florist shop. Pickering could set you up in one. Lots of money. Uh, he'll have to pull those togs you've been wearing today, and that, uh, with the eye of the jewellery, will make a big hole in 200 pounds. Why, six months ago you would have thought it a millennium to have a flower shop of your own. Come, you'll be all right. I must clear off to bed. I'm devilish sleepy. Uh, by the way, I came down for something. Uh, I forget what it was. Your slippers. Oh, yes, of course. You shied me at, shied them at me. Before you go, sir. Eh? Do my clothes belong to me or to Colonel Pickering? What the devil use would they be to Pickering? He might want them for the next girl you pick up to experiment on. Is that the way you feel towards us? I don't want to hear anything more about that. But I want to know is whether anything belongs to me. My own clothes were burnt. But what does it matter? Why need you start bothering about that in the middle of the night? I want to know what I may take away with me. I don't want to be accused of stealing. Stealing? You shouldn't have said that, Eliza. Uh, that shows a, a want of feeling. I'm sorry. I'm only an ignorant girl in my station. I have to be careful. There can't be any feelings between the like of you and the like of me. Please, will you tell me what belongs to me and what doesn't? You may take the whole damned houseful if you like. Except the jewels. They're hired. Will that satisfy you? Stop, please. Will you take these to your room and keep them safe? I don't want to run the risk of their being missing. Hand them over. If these belong to me and send it to the jewel world, I'd ram them down your ungrateful throat. This ring isn't the jeweler's. It's the one you bought me in Brighton. I don't want it now. There, let it burn. Don't hit me. Hit you? You infamous creature. How dare you accuse me of such a thing? It is you who have hit me. You have wounded me to the heart. I'm glad. I got a little of my own back anyhow. You have caused me to lose my temper, a thing that has hardly ever happened to me before. I prefer to say nothing more tonight. I am going to bed. You'd better leave a note for Mrs. Pierce about the coffee, for she won't be told by me. Damn Mrs. Pierce and damn the coffee, and damn you and damn my own folly in having lavished my hard-earned knowledge and the treasure of my regard and intimacy on a heartless gutter snipe.
camera in Martin is downstairs. We cannot take it. Well, show them up. They're using the telephone. Them. Telephone into the police, I think. What? Go upstairs and tell Mr. Luther that Mr. Henry and the Colonel are here. Ask her not to come down till I send for her. Aye, ma'am. Look here, mother. Here's a confounded thing. Yes, dear. Good morning. What is it? Eliza's bolted. You must have frightened her. Frightened her? Nonsense. She was left last night as usual to turn out the lights and all that, and instead of going to bed, she changed her clothes and went right off. What am I to do? Do without, I'm afraid, Henry. The girl has a perfect right to leave if she chooses. But I can't find anything. I don't know what my appointments I've got. I'm, 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 I'm completely at a loss. I, I, I just, I just don't know what to Good do. Good morning, Mrs. Higgins. Has Henry told you? What does that ass of an inspector say? Have you offered a reward? You don't mean to say you've sent the police after Eliza. But we want to find her. We can't let her go like this, you know, Mrs. Higgins. What were we to do? You have no more sense, either of you, than two children. Mr. Henry, a gentleman wants to see you very particular. He's been set on for Wimpole Street. Oh, bother. I can't see anyone now. Who is it? A Mr. Doolittle, sir. Doolittle? You mean the dustman? Dustman? Oh, no, sir. A gentleman. By George, pick it some relative of hers that she's gone to. Somebody we know nothing about. Tend him up, quick. I sir. Now we shall hear something. Genteel relatives. Mr. Doolin. See here. Do you see this? You done this. Done what, man? This I tell you. Look at it. Look at this hat. Look at this coat. Has Eliza been buying clothes? Eliza, not she, not F. Why would she buy me clothes? Good morning, Mr. Doolittle. Won't you sit down? Uh, asking your pardon, Mum. Thank you. I'm full of what has happened to me, and I can't think of anything else. Have you found Eliza? That's the point. You have all the luck you have. I found her, but she'll find me quick enough now after what you have done to me. But what has my son done to you, Mr. Doolittle? Done to me? Put me, destroyed my happiness, tied me up and delivered me into the hands of milk-class morality. You're mad! Oh, mad am I? Tell me this. Did you or did you not write a letter to an old blighter in America that was given five millions to form more reform societies all over the world? And, and that wanted you to invent a universal language for him? What? Ezra D. Wannafella, he's dead! Yes, he's dead and I'm done for. Now, did you or did you not write a letter to him to say that the most original moralist at present in England, to the best of your knowledge, was Alfred Doolittle, a common dustman? Oh, well, after your last visit, I remember making some silly joke of the kind. Ah, uh, you may call it a silly joke, but put the lid on me right enough. Just give him the chance he wanted to show that Americans is not like us, that they recognize and respect merit in every class of life, however humble. Them words is in his bloomin' will, in which Henry Higgins, thanks to your silly joking, he leaves me a share in his pre-digested cheese trust worth 3000 a year on condition that I lecture for his one fellow more reform world league as often as they ask me, up to six times a year. The devil he does! Whew! Well, what a lark! A safe thing for you, Doolittle. They won't ask you twice. It ain't the lecture in our mind. I'll lecture him till I'm blue in the face, I will. But, but, and, and not turn it a hair. It's making a gentleman of me that I object to. Who asked him to make a gentleman of me? I was happy. I was free. I touched pretty nigh everybody for money when I wanted it. Same as I touched you, Henry Eggins. Now I'm worth it. Tied neck and eels. And everybody touches me for money. It's a fine thing for you, says my solicitor. It is, says I. You may it's a good thing for you, I says. When I was a poor man and a solicitor once, they found me with a pram in me dust cart. He got me off and got sure of me and got me sure of him quick as he could. Same as with the doctors. Used to shove me out of the hospital before I got all his stand on my legs. And nothing to pay. Now they find out I'm not a healthy man and I can't live unless they looks after me twice a day. In the house, I'm not allowed to turn a hands for myself Somebody else must do it for me and, and touch me for it. A year ago, I had no relative in the world except for two or three that wouldn't even speak to me. Now I'm 50, and not a decent week's wages among a lot of them. I have to live for others and not for myself. That's middle-class morality. 
You talk of losing Liza. Don't you be anxious. I'll bet she's on my doorstep by this. She that could support herself easy by selling flowers if I wasn't respectable. And the next one to touch me will be you, Henry Higgins. I'll have to learn to speak middle class language from you instead of speaking proper English. That's where you'll come in, and I dare say that's what you've done it for. But, my dear Mr. Doolittle, you need not suffer all this if you're really in earnest. Nobody can force you to accept this bequest. You can repudiate it. Isn't that so, Colonel Pickering? I believe so. That's the tragedy of it, Mum. It's easy to say, chuck it. But I haven't the nerve. Which one of us has? We're all intimidated, Mum. That's what we are. What is there for me if I chuck it but the workhouse of my old age? I have to dye my hair just to keep my job as a dustman. If I was one of a deserving poor and put by a bit, I could chuck it. But why should I? Because the deserving poor might as well be millionaires for all the happiness they ever has. They don't know what happiness is. But I, as one of the undeserving poor, have nothing between me and the papa's uniform but this here blast of freight thousand a year that shows me into milk class. Excuse the expression, Mum. You'd use it too if you had my provocation. They've got you everywhere you turn. It's a choice between the skilly of the workhouse and the child brightest of the middle class. And I haven't the nerve of the workhouse. Intimidated. That's why I am. Broke. Bore up. Happier men than me will call my dust and touch me for the tip. And I look on helpless and envy them. And, and, and that's what your son's brought me to. Well, I'm very glad to see here you're not going to do anything foolish, Mr. Doolittle, for this solves the problem of Eliza's future. You can provide for her now. Yes, Mama. I'm expected to provide for everyone now. Out three thousand a year. Nonsense! He can't provide for her. He shan't provide for her. She doesn't belong to him. I paid him five pounds for her. Doolittle, either you're an honest man or a rogue. A little both, Henry. Like the rest of us. A little of both. Well, you took that money for the girl, and you have no right to take her as well. Well, Henry, don't be absurd. If you really want to know where Eliza is, she's upstairs. Upstairs? Then I shall jolly soon fetch her downstairs. Be quiet, Henry. Sit down. Yes, but I... I, 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 I do not listen to Oh, very well, very well, very well. Uh, but I think you might have told me this half an hour ago. Oh. Eliza came to me this morning. She passed the night partly walking about in a rage, partly trying to throw herself into the river and being afraid to, and partly in the Carlton Hotel. She told me the brutal way you two treated her. What? Higgins, did you bully her after I went to bed? Just the other way about. She threw my slippers in my face. She behaved in the most outrageous way. I never gave her the slightest provocation. The slippers came bang into my face the moment I entered the room, before I had uttered a word. And she used perfectly awful language. But why? What did we do to her? I think I knew pretty well what you did. The girl is naturally rather affectionate, I think, isn't she, Mr. Doolittle? Very tender on it, Mum. Takes after me. Just so. She'd become attached to you both. She worked very hard for you, Henry. I don't think you quite realise what anything in the nature of brain work means to a girl like that. Well, it seems that when the great day of trial came and she did this wonderful thing for you without making a single mistake, you two sat there and never said a word to her, but talked together of how glad you were that it was all over and how you'd been bored with the whole thing. And then you were surprised because she threw your slippers at you. I should have thrown the fire irons at you. You didn't thank her or pet her or admire her or tell her how splendid she'd been. But she knew all about that. We didn't make speeches to her, if that's what you mean. Perhaps we were a little inconsiderate. Is she very angry? Well, I'm afraid she won't go back to Wimpole Street, especially now that Mr. Doolittle is able to keep up the position you have thrust on her. She says she's quite willing to meet you on friendly terms and to let bygones be bygones. Is she, by George? <laughs> if you promise to behave yourself, Henry, I'll ask her to come down. If not, go home, for you've taken up quite enough of my time. Oh, all right. Very well. Pick you behave yourself. Let us put on our best Sunday manners for this creature that we picked out of the mud. Now, now, Henry Higgins, have some consideration for more feelings of milk classmen. Remember your promise, Henry. Mr. Doolittle, will you be so good as to step out on the balcony for a moment? I don't want Eliza to have the shock of your news until she's made it up with these two gentlemen. Do you mind? Now, as you wish, lady. Anything to help 
Henry had to keep off my hands. Ask Mr. Little to come down, please. I'm up. Oh. Where the devil is that girl? Are we to wait here all day? How do you do, Professor Higgins? Are you quite well? I'm, and of I'm, course I'm, you are. You are <laughs> never ill. So glad to see you again, Colonel Pickering. Quite chilly this morning, isn't it? Don't you dare try this game on me. I taught it to you, and it doesn't take me in. Get up and come home, and don't be a fool. Will you drop me altogether now that the experiment is over, Colonel Pickering? Oh, don't. You mustn't think of it as an experiment. It shocks me somehow. Oh, I'm only a squashed cabbage leaf. No! But I owe so much to you that I should be very unhappy if you forgot me. It's very kind of you to say so, Miss Doolittle. It's not because you paid for my dresses. I know you are generous to everybody with your money. But it is from you that I learnt really nice manners. And that is what makes one a lady, isn't it? You see, it's so very difficult for me with the example of Professor Higgins always before me. I was brought up to be just like him. Unable to control myself and using bad language on the slightest provocation. And I should never have known that ladies and gentlemen didn't behave like that if you hadn't been there. Well, oh, that's only his way, you know. He doesn't mean it. Oh, I didn't mean it either. When I was a flower girl, it was only my way. But you see, I did it. And that's what makes the difference after all. No doubt. Still, he taught you to speak. I couldn't have done that, you know. Of course, that's his profession. Damnation! It's just, just like learning to dance da in the fashionable way. There was nothing more than that. But do you know what began my real education? What? You're calling me Miss Doolittle that day when I came to Wimple Street. That was the beginning of self-respect for me. And there were a hundred little things you never noticed because they came naturally to you. Things about standing up and taking off your hat and opening doors. Oh, that was nothing. Yes, but that showed you felt and thought about me as though I was something better than a scullery maid. Though, of course, I know you would have been just the same to the scullery maid if she had been let in the drawing room. You never took your boots off in the dining room when I was there. You mustn't mind that. Higgins takes off his boots all over the place. Oh. Oh, I know. I'm not blaming him. It's his way, isn't it? But it made such a difference to me that you didn't do it. You see, really and truly, apart from the things that anyone can pick up, the, the dressing and the proper way of speaking and so on, the difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves, but how she's treated. I shall always be a flower girl to Professor Higgins because he always treats me as a flower girl and always will. But I know I can be a lady to you because you always treat me as a lady and always will. Please don't grind your teeth, Henry. I should like you to call, Eli call me Eliza now, if you would. Thank you. Eliza, of course. And I should like Professor Higgins to call me Miss Doolittle. I'll see you damned first. Henry, Henry! Why don't you slang back at him? Don't stand it. It would do him a lot of good. I can't. I could have done it once. But now I can't go back to it. Last night, when I was wandering about, a girl spoke to me. And I tried to get back to the old way with her, but it was no use. You told me, you know, that when a child is brought to a foreign country, it picks up the language in a few weeks and forgets its own. Well, I am a child in your country, and I've forgotten my own language, and I can speak nothing but yours. That's the real break-off with the corner of Tottenham Court Road. Leaving Wimple Street finishes it. Oh, but you're coming back to Wimple Street, aren't you? You'll forgive Higgins. Forgive? We'll see by George. Let her go. Let her find out how she can get on without us. She will relapse into the gutter in three weeks without me at her elbow. 
He's incorrigible, Eliza. You won't relapse, will you? No, not now. Never again. I've learnt my lesson. I don't believe I could utter another one of those sounds if I tried. Oh, 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 oh! Ha ha, just so! Victory, victory! Can you blame the girl? Don't look at me like that, Liza. It ain't my fault. I've come here to money. You're going to let yourself down and you're going to marry that low common woman now? But I have, but I'm dressed for something special today. I'm going to marry your stepmother at uh, St. George's Hanover Square. <laughs> You've touched a millionaire this time, Dad. He had to, am. Eliza. Why was she changed her mind? I'm going. Intimidated, Governor. Intimidated. Myth class morality claims its victim. Vote you pull on your hat, Liza, and see me turned off. If the <laughs> Colonel says I'm master, I'll demean myself and get insulted for my pains, like enough. Don't be afraid. She never she comes to words with anyone now, poor woman. Respectability has broke all the spirit out of her. Oh, well, just to show there's no ill feeling, I'll be back in a moment. I feel uncommon nervous about the ceremony, Colonel. Oh, I wish you'd come and see me throw it. With pleasure, as far as a bachelor can. I'll order the carriage and get ready. I shan't be more than 15 minutes. I'm going to the church to see your father married, Eliza, dear. You'd better come in the brougham with me. Colonel Pickering can go on with the bridegroom. Bridegroom, what a word. It makes a man realize his position somehow. Before I go, Eliza, do forgive him and come back to us. Do stay with us, Eliza. Well, Eliza, you've had a bit of your own, as you call it. Have you had enough, and are you going to be reasonable, or do you want any more? You want me back only to pick up your slippers and to put up with your tempers and fetch and carry for you. I haven't said I wanted you back at all. Oh, indeed. Then what are we talking about? About you, not about me. If you come back, I shall treat you as just as I've always treated you. I can't change my nature, and I don't intend to change my manners. My manners are exactly the same as Colonel Pickering's. Not true. He treats a flower girl as if she was a duchess. And I treat a duchess as if she was a flower girl. I see. The same to everyone. Just so. Like father. <laughs> well, well, without accepting the comparison at all points, Eliza, it's quite true that your father is not a snob, and that he will be quite at home in any station of life to which his eccentric destiny may call him. The great secret, Eliza, is not having bad manners or good manners or any other particular sort of manners, but having the same manner for all human souls. In short, behaving as if you were in heaven, where there are no third-class carriages and one soul is as good as another. Amen. You are a born preacher. The question is not whether I treat you rudely, but whether you have ever heard me, heard me treat anyone else better. I don't care how you treat me. I don't mind your swearing at me. I don't even mind a black eye. I've had one before this, but I won't be passed over. Then get out of my way, for I won't stop for you. You talk about me as if I were a motor bus. So you are a motor bus, all bounce and go, and no consideration for anyone. But I can do without you. Don't think I can't. I know you can. I told you you could. I know you did, you brute. You, you wanted to get rid of me. Liar. Thank you. You, you never ask yourself, I suppose, whether you, I could do without you. Don't you try to get round me. You'll have to do without me. I can do without anybody. I have my own soul, my own spark of divine fire. But uh, I will, I shall miss you, Eliza. I have learnt something from your idiotic notions. I confess that, humbly and gratefully. And I have grown accustomed to your voice and appearance. I like them, rather. Well, you have both of them on your gramophone and in your book of photographs. When you feel lonely without me, you can turn the machine on. It's got no feelings to hurt. I can't turn your soul on. Leave me those feelings and you can take away the voice in the face. They are not you. Oh, you are a devil. 
You can twist the heart of a girl as easy as some could twist her arms to hurt her. Mrs. Pierce warned me. Time and again she's wanted to leave you, and you always got around her at the last minute. And you don't care a bit for her, and you don't care a bit for me. I care for life, for humanity, and you are a part of it that has come my way and been built into my house. What more can you or anyone ask? Don't sneer at me. I, it's, it's mean to sneer at me. I have never sneered in my life. Sneering doesn't become either the human face or the human soul. I am expressing my righteous contempt for commercialism, and I don't and won't trade in affection. You've had a thousand times as much out of me as I have out of you. And if you dare to set up your little dog's tricks of fetching and carrying slippers against my creation of a Duchess Eliza, I'll slam the door in your silly face. What did you do it for if you didn't care for me? Why, because it was my job. What am I to come back for? For the fun of it. That's why I took you on. And you may throw me out tomorrow if I don't do everything you want me to. Yes, and you may uh, walk out tomorrow if I don't do everything you want me to. And live with my stepmother? Yes, or sell flowers. Oh, <laughs> if only I could go back to my flower basket, I should be independent of both you and father and all the world. Why did you take my independence from me? Why did I give it up? I'm a slave now for all my fine clothes. Not a bit. I I'll adopt you as my daughter and settle money on if you like. Or are you rather Mary Pickering? I wouldn't marry Mary. you if you asked me, and you're nearer my age than what he is. Then he is not than what he is. I'll talk oh. as I like. You're not my teacher now. I don't suppose Pickering would, though. He's as confirmed an old bachelor as I am. That's not what I want, and don't you think it? I've always had chaps enough wanting me that way. Freddie Hill writes to me twice and three times a day. Sheets and sheets. Damn his impudence! He has a right to if he likes the poor lad, and he does love me. Can he make anything of you? That's the point. Perhaps I could make something of him, but I never thought of us making anything of one another. And you never think of anything else. I only want to be natural. In short, you want me to be as infatuated about you as Freddy? Is that it? No, I don't. That's not the sort of feeling I want from you. And don't you be too sure of yourself or of me. I could have been a bad girl if I'd liked. I've seen more of some things than you for all your learning. Girls like me can drag gentlemen down to make love to them easy enough. And they wish each other dead the next minute. Of course they do. Then what in thunder are we quarreling about? I want what? a little kindness. I know I'm a common ignorant girl and you're a book learned mm. gentleman. But I'm not dirt under your feet. What I done, I... What I did was not for the dresses and the taxis. I did it because we were pleasant together. And I came to, I came to care for you, not to want you to make love to me, not forgetting the difference between us, but more friendly like. Well, of course. It's just how I feel and how Pickering feels. Eliza, you're a fool. Oh, you are a cruel tyrant. I can't talk to you. You turn everything against me. I'm always in the wrong, but you know very well all the time that you're nothing but a bully. You know I can't go back to the gutter, as you call it, and that I have no real friends in the world but you and the colonel. You know well I couldn't bear to live with the low common man after you two. And it's wicked and cruel of you to insult me by pretending that I could. You think I must go back to Wimple Street because I have nowhere else to go but fathers, but don't you be too sure that that you have me under your feet to be trampled on and talked down. I'll marry Freddy. I will, as soon as he's able to support me. Rubbish! You shall marry an ambassador. You shall marry the Governor General of India, or the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, or somebody who wants a deputy queen. I'm not going to have my masterpiece thrown away on Freddy. I'll let you see whether I'm dependent on you. If you can preach, I can teach. I'll go and be a teacher. What do you teach in heaven's name? What you taught me. I'll teach phonetics. <laughs> I'll offer myself as an assistant to to Professor Nepian.
What? That imposter, that humbug, that toadying ignoramus, teach him my methods, my discoveries? You take one step in his direction and I'll wring your neck, do you hear? Ring away. What do I care? I knew you'd strike me someday. Ha <laughs> ha Now I know how to deal with you. What a fool I was not to think of it before. You can't take away the knowledge you gave me. You said I have a finer ear than you. And I can be civil and kind to people, which is more than you can. <laughs> That's done you, Henry Higgins at Oz. Now I don't care that for your bullying and your big talk. I'll advertise it in the papers that your duchess is only a flower girl that you talk. And that she'll teach anybody to be a duchess just the same in, in six months for a thousand guineas. Oh, when I think of myself crawling under your feet and being trampled on and called names, when all the time I had just to lift up my finger to be as good as you, I could just kick myself. By God, Eliza, I said I'd make a woman of you, and I have. I like you like this. Yes, you turn around and make up to me now that I'm not afraid of you and can do without you. Of course I do, you little fool. Five minutes ago you were a millstone around my neck. Now you're a tower of strength, a concert battleship. Uh, you and I and Pickering will be three old bachelors together instead of only two men and a silly girl. The carriage is waiting, Eliza. Are you ready? <sighs> Quite. Is the professor coming? Oh, certainly not. He can't behave himself in church. Makes remarks out loud all the time on the clergyman's pronunciation. Then I shall not see you again, Professor. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye, Mother. Oh, by the way, Eliza, order a ham and a Stilton cheese, will you? And buy me a pair of reindeer gloves, number eight, and a tie to match that new suit of mine at Eel and Binman's. You can choose the color. Buy them yourself. I'm afraid you've spoiled that girl, Henry, but never mind, dear. I'll buy you the tie and gloves. Oh, don't bother. She'll buy them all right enough. Goodbye.
Thank you. 